So at the end of today, I will uh, take this video and I'll put it on that YouTube lectures channel and you can go there and check that out. There'll be, uh, like all my Algebra 2 will be in one, um, not channel, but uh, playlist and it'll be labeled so that you know what it is and what period, what date it was from. So what we're gonna go into now is uh, something that you may feel is, uh, silly to go over and boring or whatever, but fractions consistently are a big enough problem for enough people every year that we're gonna go ahead and take a few minutes and talk about it. Not only what to do, but why. That's the important thing. Because if you still, with fractions, don't know what to do, you probably don't know why you ever did it in the first place, and you'll just go on being confused and not remember what you're supposed to do. Okay. I want to change your thinking from what to do to why when we do what we do. Okay. Which is really the answer to the question, what are we doing? What, what are we trying to accomplish? We're trying to add two fractions together, what does that mean? If we're trying to collect these, uh, these fractions together in addition to subtraction, uh, what does it mean and, and why would we find a common denominator, right? We may know that that's what you're supposed to do. Or you may be on the cusp of, I can't quite remember, if I have two thirds, it's too dark. If I have two thirds plus five sevenths, can you see that all right? Okay. If I'm supposed to add those fractions together, if, if you've ever, in the last few years, come up with this, Common thing, I see it quite a bit, even with higher levels of math, they're still confused about what to do. And I really will continue to try and sell you on the idea that you shouldn't be thinking about what do I do, but what is the process, what are the steps one, two, three, but what am I trying to accomplish, how do I do that and why? Okay, so let's forget about this idea that we would just add the numerators and the denominators together. Of course, we know we should do what when we add fractions? Common denominator. Can anybody explain why we need a common denominator? Make them like compare them. Add them after that. So we can add them, okay? That's uh, kind of focused on the process, right? We wanna add them so we need a common denominator, but why do we need a common denominator? Not just so that we can add them, but what do we say back here in the learn some names? So let's call it. I just said that they have to be like comparable to actually do that. Okay. So they need to be like the same to do that process. Um, They're different right now, right? Yeah. What's different about these two fractions? The denominator. Yeah, I mean the numerators are different too. Well, we get well, the numerators, yeah. right? So what is it that's different that makes them not comparable, makes them uncombinable? The denominator needs to be the same, they need to kind of be the same thing, okay? My analogy would be apples and oranges. I can't add two apples and three oranges and then say I have five, how would I finish that sentence, right? Five fruit? Well, and I can't go back, right? I can't like decompose that into two apples and three oranges, right? I've lost the identity of what the fruit was, you see what I mean? They're, they're analogies, they're not perfect, right? But you see what I mean, they're two different things that I can't put them together. Until these are the same, until I can turn an apple into an orange, I can't compare them, I can't put them together. Okay? So I'm going to ask again, what is it that's different about these fractions that getting a common denominator makes the same? By the way, what is what is that denominator? What what does it tell us about? What information does it give us? 
there are three parts to that circle. It's three parts to the circle, to the rectangle, to the sphere, to the, you know, whatever we cut into three pieces. It would take three of these equally sized pieces to make a whole of a circle, a whole circle or a whole rectangle or whatever, okay? So I'm showing you the denominator now just by the way that I cut up this pie, right? So that's the denominator. What's the numerator? How would I show the numerator? Um, how many parts of the circle you just color in? Okay, so let's color it in. Now I can see the whole fraction. I know how many pieces make up the whole, and I know how many pieces of the size I have. Okay, so I have two pieces of pie of the size three makes a whole. All right, that's pretty much the shortest way I can say exactly what this fraction is. So now we come over here to 3 fifths. Cut them into fifths, it's a little trickier. It's close, 3 fifths. We have three of those. And now we can see, just like we can see with apples and oranges, we can see why we can't put these together. So I can't say that I have five of anything. So I have to make it, we know in fractions, a, a different number of a different size piece with a different number of a different size piece, but now these pieces will be what? Evenly sized, right? Without getting caught up in the, uh, this is how you find common denominators uh, rhetoric, I mean, here, if you physically had two pieces, okay, then how would you actually go about making sure that we get the same size pieces here as we do here? You make them equal slices, I guess, by turning them each into 15. Okay, so I have three pieces here total for the whole. You know, I have five pieces for the whole here, and so the only number of pieces that I could get the same out of here and here, at least the smallest one, they're really huge ones, we can cut them into, but the smallest number of pieces that I could easily cut this into and cut this into would be 15 pieces, right? We're all familiar with that, find the lowest common denominator, the lowest common multiple of both, okay? And physically, the way I would do that is take each of these three pieces and do what with them? Each of the three pieces, cut them into five, right? Cut this into five pieces, and this one, two, this one as well, cut them into five. I cut each of those three pieces into five pieces. Here's what we did uh, here in the, the fraction world. We multiplied this guy by five. Right? There's that part of that. And at the same time, unavoidably, we also, kind of ignoring this piece, to these two pieces, we also cut that into five pieces each. Right? We increased the number of pieces uh, by five, by a factor of five. So also these, both of these two pieces uh, have been made to be five times as many, right? Not five times bigger, they're the same size, but they're five times as many, right? So now this is how many pieces it takes up to make the whole. This is how many of those pieces we have. Okay. And if you come over here, we do the same thing. We cut each of these into three pieces. By going around and slicing every single piece into three pieces, We've made it a new number of pieces to make up the whole. Right? And at the same time, we took these three pieces and we also increased their number by a factor of five. So now we have two pies, pizzas, circles, whatever. What did I? You did three times five instead of three times three. Oh, I should have a three here. We've now made two pizzas have the same size pieces, and now we can compare them, okay? So, what I hope you get, at least like the, the simplest reminder, if you're asking yourself, how do I add fractions? You've gotta remember that this guy down here tells me how big a piece it is. This tells me how many there are. This tells me how big the piece is, if the pieces are different sizes, then we can't compare them. Right? So we gotta get them to be the same size, and that's what the common denominator is. It's this, it makes them the same size. Uh, and at the same time that we increase this number by a factor of five, we do the same thing to however many we have. We increase it by a factor of five. Now we have 10 15ths plus nine 15ths, 19 15ths. 
And that's why also, if it's ever seemed strange to you that the denominator doesn't change while the numerator does change, okay, it's because this here is just telling us how big the piece is. This is the only thing that really tells us how many we actually have. If we start adding these together, we're not understanding what the denominator is or, communicate, or what, uh, what information is communicated. Okay. Have you gained any new understanding through this? Mm -hmm. Raise your hand if you have any new understanding whatsoever. And I hope at the very least, you never do this again. Right? I hope that never happens again. At least you get a little red light going off in your brain saying, no, that's not right. I know I should not put that on the answer. Okay. Let's just, uh, for heaven's sake, cross that out. Not correct. Right. Any questions about adding and by extension, subtracting fractions. Well, get on that. I wouldn't go over it if it hadn't already been an issue in every year I've ever taught math, even in Algebra 2. Okay. And when we get to uh, the parts of Algebra where this, where fractions are needed, I mean, beyond just adding simple fractions together, like when we algebraize them and we put variables in there. You know, we're going to have to go back to the basics. How do we add fractions? Why do we do that? Uh, and if we can understand why we do what we do, it makes that part of it that much easier to adjust to. Right? We have a stronger foundation, and when we start putting x's and y's in there, we'll be all right. OK. So now, let's go on. I like to color these pages so we're not just looking at white. So feel free to. So uh, now we're going to talk about multiplying fractions together. How do we multiply fractions together? We don't know. Anybody know how to multiply fractions together? Anybody trying to decide between two things? I'm not quite sure. Uh, okay, good. These are the people I want to catch. Do we need a common denominator? No. No, no. no we're not. No, it's go no, it's not completely clear why we don't need a common denominator. If we don't know why we do what we do. We multiply straight across, yes, this is correct. All right? If you multiply straight across, you will be just fine through all of your fraction dealings. Okay? But I want you to understand why. So let's take a crack at that. We have two thirds times, uh, I want to make sure you don't cancel. Um, do you want to start with the right way or be showing you why the wrong way is wrong? Do you want to see it done right or do you want to explain it? Do you want me to explain why the wrong way is wrong? Wrong. Right. Wrong? Wrong. Right. Right. Okay, let's vote. Wrong first. Okay. So, okay, and, and right first. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me show you what the wrong way is, what's the most common mistake in doing it incorrectly, and why it doesn't. I can at least prove to you it doesn't work. Okay, so a really common mistake is seeing two fractions here, and then we multiply and thinking cross multiply. Is oh. anybody guilty of that? No, I'm sure. Okay, I think that that's really the only mistake that gets made when you multiply fractions. You can find a common denominator and then multiply like you normally would, and you still will get the right answer. It'll be like a fraction you can simplify, like terribly unique to simplify that fraction. It'll be way bigger than the numerator and denominator than necessary. But uh, what really is a mistake is trying to do cross multiplication. Okay, so let's do what I've seen done, and then I'll at least show you that it, it shouldn't be done that way. Okay, so someone will think I'll do the two times the five. That's the cross part. I go across, and we will get ten. And three times four will get twelve. Okay, let's just say I did that. Seen it done lots of times, it's a common mistake. I first want to at least show you that can't be right. All right so if you're thinking, oh, I'll, I'll cross multiply, I'm going to give you a red light alert just like I did hopefully with the, that, the adding fractions. Oh, I, I definitely know that I shouldn't do that. All right, so let's remember the process we followed. This guy down to there, and that's our bottom. 
and this up to there, there's our numerator, okay? So here I'm going to uh, do the proof by contradiction to show you that that can't be the case. When I multiply, say, two times three, can I do three times two and get the same thing? Yeah. Okay, so we're using a property of uh, multiplication, it's called a commutative property. When I switch the order of the numbers with real numbers, I should get the exact same product. Right? Two times three is six, three times two is six. So if I take four fifths times two thirds, I need to get 12 tenths. Right? If, if cross multiply is the way to go, then it needs to happen that way. All right? So let's follow the exact same thing. I did this guy times that guy, and that became the denominator. So this guy times that guy gives me that denominator. This one times that gives me and what have I wound up with? The, the what's it called? Reciprocal. Reciprocal, yeah. You have flipped over. Okay? So now you remember the word reciprocal when you take a fraction and flip it over, that's called a reciprocal. All right. Well, now we know 12 tenths is not the correct answer. We know that 12 is not the correct answer. Because what did I do? I took two numbers, I switched their order, which I should be able to do. That's just something we can do with multiplication. And I got two different answers, okay? So again, maybe that'll give you a little bit of an alert. If you're thinking, how do I multiply these fractions together? Let me cross multiply. You realize that can't be right, because if I switch them, I'm just gonna get the exact inverse of that number, okay? Really quickly, I'm gonna show you what cross multiplying is, like why it's in your brain. If it is there, if we have uh, that I can wash uh, three cars in five hours, then how many cars can I wash in 17 hours? Right? It's a ratio, it's proportion. Proportion is one fraction equals another fraction. Three cars is to five hours, as x cars is to 17 hours, and I cross multiply and solve for x. Okay, that's what cross multiply we get 3 times 17 and we get 351 equals 5x, okay. And then we divide by 5 and then we find out that x, the number of cars that I can wash in 17 hours is about 151 divided by 5, it's, okay, a little over 10. 10.2, no, yeah, 10.2? 10 and 1 fifth, yes. I like that even better, 10 and 1 fifth. Okay, so proof that you cannot cross multiply two fractions together and get the product of those two fractions. A reminder of what cross multiplying actually is for, and now on to why we would do what we're supposed to do. Okay? So let's take that same 2 thirds times 4 fifths. And let me remind you that if I take 10 times a half, I'm just going to remind you what multiplying by a fraction kind of means. Okay? If I multiply 10 by a half, I want to find half of 10. Right? Half of 10. What's half of 10? Minus 5. It's 10 divided by 2. So I just want to remind you, when I'm multiplying by this fraction, I'm wanting to find this much of this. Half of this. When I multiply 2 thirds by 4 fifths, I want to find 4 fifths of 2 thirds. I take 2 thirds, and I cut it up in such a way uh, that it's in fifths. How much is 4 fifths of that? And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to draw a picture of, of doing what I just described. Draw a picture of two-thirds. So we got two-thirds. And when we then want to, like, now concentrating on the two-thirds as, like, the whole thing, we wanted to find what's four-fifths of that. Does that make sense? Now two-thirds, that's like my whole world now. Now I want to figure out what's four-fifths of that two-thirds. Just like I want to figure out what was half of 10. Okay, so let's figure out what's four-fifths of this. Uh, well, it would be nice if I could just cut this whole thing into five pieces. But if I did that, then I'd get like this line going through one of those pieces, right? Does that make sense? Okay. So really what I need to do is come through this whole thing and cut each piece into five pieces. Right? So then I can figure out what four fifths is. So we will just cut everything into five pieces. Okay. What have we just done? Like mathematically, we've multiplied the denominators together. We 
figure out how big are these pieces now. If I cut a piece that is the size three of them makes the whole into five pieces each, now all together 15 pieces make the whole. So now we're working in 15s. How many of those 15s do we have? Well, we just want to count up four fifths. So one, two, three, four, right? That's four fifths of this this third, and we want four fifths of this third, and we'll count up these. What size things are we counting up? How big are they? One fifth. One fifteen? Uh, They're one fifth of a third, so then one, one fifth of a third would be a fifth. Yeah, so we count up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? That's two groups, two groups of four things. That's multiplying two times four. That's how we figure out that we have eight pieces of the size 15 make the whole. Okay? Have you gained any new understanding from that? Yeah. Okay, good. So, really, uh, functionally, all we need this to have done is to never allow us to add, subtract, or multiply fractions incorrectly. Right? And if it's accomplished that, then great. If uh, you already never made that mistake, that's great too. But enough people make that mistake throughout the year that I didn't want to just charge ahead without making the, the best of this time and reminding you of that. So, um, so lastly, may know what you're supposed to do, but I want to kind of give you a little reminder if you're ever down the road and you wonder why am I supposed to do that, uh, which one am I supposed to do, give you a little reminder. So two thirds divided by um, five sevenths, let's say. Okay, so we all know that when you divide fractions, you're supposed to multiply by the, okay, now here's the question part, the reciprocal of what? Okay, so the reciprocal of the numerator is the reciprocal of the denominator. Am I supposed to multiply two thirds by seven fifths or five sevenths by three halves? That's the thing that people most often get confused about. Okay, I see them flip one of them over and then they multiply straight across and everything else. It's great, but it's, it's definitely incorrect if you don't know what you're doing. Well, I guess if you guess lucky, then it's not incorrect. Okay, so is it two thirds times seven fifths or five sevenths times? If I have something like three-fifths, I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by the same number, right? In fact, that's how we find common denominators. So we do it all the time, finding common denominators. So let's think about why for a second. Uh, let's say we multiply by seven over seven. And this could be an e easily a million over a million. It doesn't matter as long as I multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing. Okay, let's look at why that is. What is this worth? One. one. Can I multiply numbers by one all day long and not change them? Yes. Not change their size at least. I can change the way they look. Like if I do multiply by 7 over 7, I have 21 over 35. Those pieces are smaller, I have more number of them, uh, but they're, they're worth the same amount. Okay? So I'm going to use this to kind of remind you which way it's supposed to go. Right? Let's first do it the right way. Let's say we multiply 2 thirds by 7 fifths. Well, let me just multiply the denominator by 7 fifths as well. Right? The multiplying two fractions together here. Uh, this one is worth one. So I haven't really done anything. But let's see what happens. What happens in the denominator? What do I get here when I multiply five sevenths by seven fifths? 35 over 35. Yeah, 35 over 35, and what's that? So now I've got something over one. Something over one, I don't really need to write over one, right? Like if I want to turn three into a fraction, I can write it as three over one to help me you know, bring it into fraction land work with it. But I don't have to write over 1. So the, the point I'm making here is we can kind of ignore this over 1. And whatever we get here, that is it. So we get 2 times 7 is 14 over 3 times 5 is 15. If you want to change the way that you divide fractions to doing this, never go wrong. Okay? Keep it all straight. Let's see what happens if we think, what if we multiply uh, 5 7 by 3 halves? So let's rewrite this 2 thirds. So we're going to do this 
same thing. I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing, 3 halves. So you can already see like, what's going on. We get the multiplication. We were wondering if that's the right thing. It turns out it's in the denominator of the bigger fraction. Okay? So we multiply this guy together. We get 6 over 6. We get 1 over 5 over 15. 6 over 2 is 15. Now, this, this number is correct. But what do you have when you have 1 over a fraction? How can I rewrite that? Uh, 1 over a fraction is the same as the reciprocal of the fraction. Okay? Uh, 14 fifths, excuse me. 14 over 15. There we go. If you go about it the long way, and we can just multiply this by 14 over 15, and that cancels everything. Here, multiply this by 14 over 15, and we get 14 15 like we should. Okay. So, hopefully, we always know to find common denominators, and we know why we find common denominators because they're not the same thing until we find common denominators. I can't add a fourth to a seventh because they're not the same size. So, both ways are correct. This is 1 over 15 fourths is. Um, if I gave you 1 over 15 fourths dollars, and I gave you 14 15 dollars, I would have given you the same amount either way. Now, this is not the way we like to look at fractions, and so we want to rewrite it so it's correct. Um, the thing that happens that, that is incorrect is you just jump to, let's multiply by the reciprocal of the numerator, and then you just get as your answer 15 14 right? Which you should, we should get 14 15 So the mistake comes when I kind of remember that I'm supposed to multiply by the reciprocal, but I forget which one I'm supposed to make the reciprocal and then multiply by the other one. Um, but I really recommend this. If, if you ever make that mistake, if you ever have made that mistake, just start doing it this way. You'll never make the mistake again. If you do it the wrong way, you'll just wind up with this, and you'll remember, oh, I need to flip that over. That needs to be 14 15 Okay. And when I watch people do it that way, they never make mistakes, in at least that mistake. They don't make that mistake ever. Okay. So we'll always find common denominators and we'll have some kind of a notion as to why because they're not the same thing until we get them to be the same size. Uh, we will never cross multiply to find the product of two fractions. We'll remember that that's for proportions, that's for equations, we're going to try to solve for x. Um, and now that we know how to multiply fractions, we'll never make the mistake of taking the wrong fraction here to be the reciprocal. Always the reciprocal of the denominator, never the numerator. Okay? Hopefully you gained any small bit of new insight to that. That would be great. Okay. And I hope that you've been taking notes like this, and along the side, if it's something new for you, you've written things like, uh, why do we find a common denominator? And then you got a little answer over here. It's like, well, when the denominators are different, the pieces are different sizes, so we can't compare them. We can't put them together. Something like that. Why don't we cross multiply? Your answer could be, well, cross multiply is for proportions. It's when you have a fraction equal to another fraction. Or uh, we can't cross multiply because you know if you try it and then you switch the order of the numbers you're multiplying, you get a different answer. So that could possibly be right. Put a little example there. Okay. Uh, and uh, another question, when we define fractions, we multiply by the reciprocal of the denominator or the reciprocal of the numerator. Okay, and over here, you have the answer. It's, uh, well, at least it's the reciprocal of the denominator. Or here's a little example or reminder of how I can be sure I get the reciprocal, the right reciprocal in the right place. Okay, so that's fractions. This is going to be the last time that I actively teach you fractions like it's something you not been exposed to before. All right, so are there any questions at all before we close this chapter forever? Okay. If you still have trouble, I will help you. I'll help you one-on-one -on -one and do my best to help you during class. But it'll be one of those things I assume you got it, you know it. Uh, at best, I need to give you a quick reminder and you're back in the back of the game. But if you still have trouble and you need to ask questions, now it's going to be like a one-on-one -on -one thing uh, almost primarily. Okay?
Now we're going to talk about um, a couple of things together, functions and graphs. Because I can bet there's at least a couple of you, you might just reading your piece of paper that you handed to me uh, about two days ago. I know that people struggle with graphs. So this is a algebra 2 universal. Year after year, uh, everyone has to have confusion about graphs. Right? So I'm going to try and help you with that before we so I'm assuming you know the basics about graphs. I will bet that some of you don't understand the basics of what a graph really is. Okay, so we're going to get into that. Um, but first, we have to start with functions. A graph really is just a function, just a different way to look at it. Okay, but let's start with an equation version of a function. You can look at a function many different ways, but we'll start with an equation version. Um, so, like I said, we'll, we'll write it as an equation, but a function is anything, absolutely anything. It can look like Put something into, and what happens? What do you think? Put something into it. You get something done. You get something done. That's it. Okay. There's a tiny caveat on that that I won't bother you with right now, but that's the basics. That's really it. You put something into a function, something comes out of the function, and that's all a function is. With that tiny caveat that I won't bother you with. Okay. So can anybody give me an equation that you can put something into, and then something will come out? Yes, a toaster is, by mathematical definition, a function. You put in bread, a toast comes out, right? You put in dry bread, you get out rye bread. You put in white bread, you get out white bread. Okay, this is a function. But if we want to write like a mathemat mathematical equation, what's a mathematical equation? It's an example of something you could put something into, like bread, and something comes out, like toast. Something in, stuff happens to it. from how we classically write functions. Classic function would be y on one side, x on the other side. This is a function too. And it can work either way. I can put things in for x, which is typical. We typically put things in at x, and we get them out at y. And it's like, uh, you know, I guess a toaster doesn't work quite like this. But those toasters like in quiz zones, or, or, you know, that has like, or Cafe Rio, where they are on that little belt, and it goes in one side and out the other. Okay, that's more like how a function looks. This is like the in slot of that toaster, and this is like the out slot. Okay? But you know what you could do? I don't know if these toasters have this function, but you could run it in reverse, right? Put it in this side, it comes on that side. It doesn't matter. We can use mathematical functions in any way we want. Alright? So we put something in, what can we put in for x? Hint anything you want. Nine, two. Nine? We'll do 9 and we'll do 2. So we're going to do 9. Okay, and something's going to come out. If I need to do a little bit of work here. Put 9 there. Four. Okay, now we're trying to solve for y, right? So y is solve for y. Minus 4 on both sides. So you get 5 equals negative y. 5 minus 1. 5 by negative 1. Negative 5 is equal to y. Alright, we just used the function, right? Put in a uh, sweet pork burrito, and out came a melty, cheesy sweet pork burrito. Okay. <laughs> now, on the path to understand what a graph is, we just need a way to keep track of these things that we do. We just put something in and got something out. Right? So we need a way to keep track of that. And what way can you think of to just Log it away, just write it somewhere that when we put in 9, we got out negative 5. How can we do that? We can absolutely do it any way we want. A chart? Like what kind of a chart? There we go. Right. And that's probably something you've seen before, right? What do you call it? An XY chart, T graph, or I don't know what you guys call it. But, uh, call it anything you want. Right across from each other, we write. Um, Whatever we put in, 9, we got out negative 5. Okay? Because we never want to have to do that work again. 
we want to just keep track of that. We want to know that when we put this 9 in, we get a negative 5 out. Let's do it again. I heard 2, so let's put, uh, let's just write 2 equals y plus 4. Subtract 4 from both sides, just like we did before. Negative 2 equals negative y, and y equals positive 2. And we write that down. 2 in, 2 out. Okay. How many times can we do this? Forever. We can do it forever. We can do it with all the whole numbers, all the integers, which are whole numbers, but they include negatives and zero. We can do all the fractions and all the decimals. Forever. It could be your job. This could be the job for your entire lineage for as long as uh, Earth is still around. You can never run out of work to do because you never run out of numbers to plug into this function. Okay? So, we won't be worrying about graphs quite yet, but. That's the basics. We get a function, something goes in, and something comes out. Okay. How strong does that understanding feel? A scale of strong. one to five. Deep. Okay. Because if you if you think that I'm making this point too much, uh, you won't think so when we come back to it. And I tell you, it comes back to this very basic thing. You put something into a function, and something comes out, and we want to keep track of it. Goes in, something comes out, and we want to keep track of it. It might take a little imagination on your side to imagine that you want to keep track of the things that go in and out of the function. So we just kind of have to assume that that's the case. Okay? Let's do another function. Actually, we only have a couple minutes left. So I'm going to give you a couple of functions you on your own. I really want a very simple thing. Uh, I will give you a couple of functions. I'll even make them more basic. Why? equals 3 fourths, 3 fourths x plus 2. I do not want the graphs of these. I don't want I'm not interested in that at all right now. I want you to do a very simple thing, and that is to plug in three things and find what comes out for each of those things, three things and figure out a way to keep track of it. And you know, I'm going to challenge you to keep track of those things in a different way from this. Okay? And nothing no way that you keep track of the inputs and outputs will be wrong. There's not only like four prescribed ways that you can do this. The ways that we use are just ways that somebody made up, and now we still use them today. Any way that you can think of to track this went in and this came out, that's all I want. So three things go in, three things you know, go along with those three things. I'm going to give you one more function. That's the other one. Starting off easy, beginning of the year here. We've got two functions. I just want you to put in each of those. I want you to put in three things. Uh, and keep track. 